right. It's waiting for YouTube here. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are. I think we're live. <clears throat> good afternoon or good evening, everybody. I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And it's always a, a real pleasure to have Lisa Lutz back with us, albeit virtually and not in the store like usual. Um, great to see you, Lisa. It's good to see you guys. I know it's a little weird to to not be in there when no. I've done that every year for all of them, pretty I much. It. I, I think it has been all of your books. As a matter of fact, I was just looking them up to remind myself all of the Spellmans from the oh, Spellman yeah. files on up. And then I remember How to Start a Fire. That was a really yep. interesting book. And The Passengers and the Swallows. Yeah. So here we are. Well, it's good Great to see you world. guys. <laughs> well, uh, Lisa kindly signed a bunch of copies of her brand new book, The Accomplice, and I've got some here. And I will, here's the signature, I will go ahead and put a link in the comments field on Facebook and YouTube if you'd like to purchase one. And I'll also be monitoring that. So if you have questions for Lisa, don't be shy. Uh, put them in as they occur to you throughout the hour. And Barbara will summon me back on screen, screen at some point. I'll be happy to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Oh, thank you, Patrick. It's so great to see you, Lisa. And you know what? We can probably coax Patrick to come back early if we want yeah. to, because his insights, I think, especially to this book, might will be really valuable. So thank yeah. you for signing copies for us, which we greatly appreciate. Um, it's an interesting book. Um, and I like the way you start us out in the library and um, have you actually witnessed an epileptic attack? That is, you're the first person to ask me that question. And, uh, and you know, I rarely pull from real life, but I, I, I have, uh, I had a roommate I, when I was an exchange student in England. And uh, she told me the first night, like that I was there, that she was epileptic. And I was the only of, of everyone in the flat to see the, her seizures. And the first time I was totally freaked out. And then the second time, way less freaked out. And then the third time, I distinctly remember continuing to drink my coffee as she slowly sort of fell to the floor because I'd just gotten so used to it. I knew how it would go. Um, but we always sort of joked about it. Um, so I think that there was, it was easier for me to feel like that was okay. I don't know. If, uh, well, I, I thought your description of it, um, and the reason I say that is that my much loved middle sister, or sorry, my only sister, but she's the middle child in our family, was stricken with um, not meningitis, but the other one. I can't ever remember the name of it anyway. And she suffered brain damage and um, was then subject to those kinds of fits, um, which eventually, um, eventually she died from it. It was oh. a progressive kind of a thing. And it was not assisted by the fact that when she had one of those fits, she fell. And living in Manhattan, oftentimes where she fell was, you know, hardly ideal. But yeah. so we, like you, you kind of got used to them, you know, it'd be like you'd sit at the dinner table and you'd see what was it and you'd just catch her, you know, because there wasn't really any way to stop it. And I thought, I thought the way you wrote about it, that you must have had some kind of a similar experience. Yeah, no, I, I definitely seen it. Uh, and I've seen it with a dog too, and no one believed me. And then later they diagnosed the dog with epilepsy, but it's neither here nor there. So it's not a major part of the book at all, but the, no. reason, the reason for it, and I bring it up, is that this is the opportunity for these two students um, who might otherwise really not have gotten together, but this is how Owen and uh, Luna. Yeah. Meet. So do you want to describe your, your scene now that I've said that that was a key part of it? So Owen and Luna, we, we, we first meet them in college. And then, uh, so the book has two timelines, uh, one part's in college and the other part's when they're in their thirties and they're still very close, but in their college meet, uh, they've been eyeing each other a bit in class. There's a certain curiosity. It's, I wouldn't call it, uh, any kind of romantic attraction, but there's definitely a curiosity about the other person. And Luna agrees to let Owen borrow her notes. And then when he comes, she comes to get her, her notes 
um, the fluorescent lights start to sort of agitate her and she has a seizure and Owen witnesses it, he calls 911. And then when she wakes up from it, she sort of acts like she's just committed a crime and sort of makes a run for it out of the library because she just doesn't want to deal with EMTs or anything like that. And Owen follows her because he's so curious about the whole thing um, and her strange behavior, like she'd done something wrong. Um, but anyway, so that's how they meet. It's like uh, a meet cute, but it's a platonic one. So, you know, I find it interesting that you decided to write a whole book about um, a man and a woman who were very, very close, but um, it is platonic. I mean, you know, most of the time there's going to be some sort of, well, I won't say there's no sexual tension, that would hardly be fair, but um, but they, they have different lives. They pursue different lives with different partners and so forth, but they manage to stay close. So, you know, it's a question that comes up a lot, Lisa, in fiction is that, you know, is it possible to have a male-female friendship that is free, you know, from sexual overtones? I mean, I have a lot of them and, and I've, I have had over the years and I, I think it's it. I think it used to be rarer than it is, and I think it's sort of it. Depending on what generation you are, like the kids now, I think it's fairly common. Although I, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I I think the thing with Owen and Luna though is, it, I wouldn't say it never crossed their minds any sort of romantic interest. I think at some point they realized that they really needed the friendship and. Um, they they just chose they chose to remain only friends to to because they valued that so much. Why did they why did they need the friendship? I mean that's you know that's a really interesting remark that you just made. I think well I, I mean obviously I think that as when people read the book they'll they'll come up with their own reasons for it and I have some that I will can tell you and some that I I, I would rather not. <laughs> but yeah but I. So I think that while Owen may seem sort of, at least in the beginning, more sort of social and adaptable and kind of charming, and, and Luna's really kind of the opposite, but she, it's not that she's without her charms, she's just stranger than he is. Um, I think Owen has more issues than he lets on, and so he sees something in Luna that he relates to. And he's drawn to that. And I think he feels like he can be himself uh, with her. And, and that, I don't think he really feels that way with anyone else, no one in his family um, and none of, none of his friends. And it's the first time I think he really felt that way. And with Luna's, Owen's the first person who's not really afraid of her. Like she's aware that people are afraid of her and uneasy about, with her. And if she shows who she really is or, or if they know about her past, which is sort of this big secret that I will not reveal. Um, I think that Owen has always sort of had this ability to like deal with her temper and her weirdness in a very different way than other people. And sometimes it's really about like just your temperament too, like the way you get along with someone. It's not even about having things in common. Um, does either of them have a sibling? Owen has a brother, and then he plays a big part in the book. Uh, and Luna also had a, has a brother who plays a big part in the book. Yeah. I mean, I, I asked because, you know, it does sound to some degree as though these may be, you know, if, if they're not, if you, if you don't have a sibling, or maybe your sibling is not that, um, greater relationship, you might seek somebody. I'm not saying that's the case in the book, but you might seek somebody outside your family, um, you know, to have that kind of relationship with. We have a friend who stays with us in the winter. And while, you know, she's my friend, she and my husband, I mean, they spend, they sound like brother and sister. They just pick her back and forth, you know, <laughs> they do. I mean, really, it's a, yeah. she has a very different relationship with him than she has with me, but he has one brother who's deceased and she has no siblings. And so for them, I think it's a very, um, it's a very nice thing, you know, to sort of have that kind of um, sibling relationship if you don't have one, but that's not the case in this book, is it? Well, sort of, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that 
if your relationship with your sibling isn't isn't what you want it to be, yeah, then then you can definitely um, seek those sibling type relationships, you know, with your friends. So we meet them in college, but then, as you said, there are two timelines to the book. So how do we, you know, do you, how did you structure the narrative so that we can spend time with young Owen and Luna and then more mature Owen and Luna? It's mostly a back and forth. So we meet, we see them first in college and then we see them about 15 years later and then we go back and forth. And so in, um, but in the later timeline, Owen's wife is brutally murdered. And that starts to sort of um, shed new light on things that happened in their past. And so we, we realize that there's a suspicious death from their college years. And then that makes everyone reconsider not just whether Owen killed his wife in the more recent timeline, but whether he had something to do with the suspicious death from way back when. But it's, I mean, ultimately, I think the book is really about like how well you know someone and what it would take to, to shift that over and to make you, someone you trust completely, what would make you doubt them? How much would it take? And it's sort of about those little moments, those increments of doubt, in, you know, what's the tipping point? So well, I'm trying to think if this will be a spoiler. Is it true for both of them or is it more one-sided that one of them has more doubts and, and, than the other? I think it's the way to look at it is like in, in each timeline, one has more secrets than the other and there's more to be revealed. But I think, I think it really is, you start to realize that they both have secrets. It might feel a little like it's all on Owen, like he's a suspicious party. But later on, it becomes obvious that there's a lot going on with Luna that, that we, he didn't know about. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think the way you did this is fascinating. And there, there are a lot of books out recently, well, for actually several years, about toxic friendships, particularly toxic female friendships. It seems to be much more in the female thing. Uh, we had um, I did an event last night for an author who has toxic relationships all over the place. Um, and, you know, it's almost become, it's become kind of a trope, you know, in, in, um, in fiction to have that sort of thing, probably aggravated in part by social media that, you know, it's possible to, to expand the range of toxicity. You know, it used to be really personal. You had to be with people for that. But right. now, you know, total strangers can, you know, can behave miserably to you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I can, I, have, I don't do social media. I, I do the Instagram account for the bookstore and that's it. So if I'm being, you know, trashed out, whatever the words are on Facebook or whatever it is, I'll never know. Cause that, and, and I don't care. But if you lead your life, yeah. on, you know, if it, if I'm, I am at my age able to do that, but I can't imagine anybody younger, much younger than I am, who has enough, um, who, who isn't on social media and therefore very vulnerable to that. So I thought it was interesting that you decided to write a different kind of friendship, you know, in a land where toxic friendship seems to be sort of the hallmark of much fiction. Yeah. So I, I think that like, whenever I start working on a book, I, I always, I never think about like, okay, what are people doing? What is, what, I never think about like, what is done. I always think, what do I want to do? And what's yeah. not going to make me miserable or bore me. So I like, I'm not really like, I understand social media is part of the world and I will only use it to the extent that I have to, to acknowledge living in a certain reality, but I hate it. And I also think there are plenty of people who aren't on it. And I, I it's also feels clunky and like, uh, it, from a writing perspective, there's something about so, social media stuff that makes me feel like everything's cluttered. Like I, and I don't, I don't know how to explain that, but just, I feel clutter, like it, it would clutter the book, it would clutter my create. It just doesn't feel right. So I will only use it as far as reflecting reality. Um, 
Yeah. So I actually, this book, they're not on it, but I think there's a, there, it's, there are logical reasons why. No, I understand that. But I mean, I find it interesting how many people um, are, you know, seem to be finding community on social media, but then, you know, at the same time, these people, you know, they're, they're, you don't even know if they're real for one thing. I mean, you know, you, you can hide your identity and so forth, but then people seem to get so caught up in, um, you know, either, either comparing their lives to other people's lives, which appear to be more glamorous, you know, more curated or letting, letting complete strangers make you feel bad. And then I keep reading things like, you know, the other day there was an actual piece, I think it was the New York Times, the ethicist column on Sunday. And a woman wrote in and wanted to know now that her relationship was over, could she get her nude pictures back? And if she asked for them, would he retaliate? And, and my, see, my reaction is, why did you send him nude pictures? I mean, once you did that, you yeah. know, you're screwed. They're never going to go away. So if you're going to do it, I mean, Anthony, what's an Anthony Weiner or Weiner, whatever, <laughs> yeah. said, you know, he never seemed to get that message. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so I, I, I just find it fascinating that, um, that the, I guess what I find difficult to understand is there seems to be some expectation of privacy that people have. And in a, and yet, you know, there is none. There's absolutely zero privacy in, in any electronic communication. If you watch crime shows, you can see, for example, um, that the police can retrieve all your texts. You know, I mean, anything that you send out there, they can catch it from your, um, your provider. So you just laid yourself open if you, you know, decide to commit a crime, but you send out breadcrumbs, <laughs> they're going to yeah. find you. So, right. I mean, any, any person, any intelligent criminal or whatever it is, you know, should ditch their phone, never do all this stuff. And yet somehow or other, they don't. So I, I like the fact that you wrote your book, you know, without all that going on. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I will try to avoid it as much as possible. And as I, uh, in the last couple of years where I think people turn to it much more, I think I resisted it much more where I just recognized it wasn't healthy. I'm also, uh, you know, I think a lot of crime writers are probably slightly, slightly paranoid maybe, but I'm way more paranoid than most. And I'm really like crazy, crazy level private. Like I used to like, when I would, lived in San Francisco and I would be on a bus with a friend, even if we were having the most banal conversation about like nothing, I would like speak it really privately, quietly. Cause I just don't, I don't want strangers listening in on a conversation. So the whole, the, the pretext in social media, especially with promoting a book where you're just sort of, you're just saying nice things about another person's book or whatever. I'm so bad at it. Cause I have that like, Oh, I, I'm having a public conversation. I just, who's watching me? And, and, you know, and then, you know, someone who's makes so many typos, it's unbelievable. Then it's a whole other thing. There's so much anxiety for me about it that I just, yeah, limited as much as possible, which, you know, isn't ideal during the week of your book coming out, but I, I got to take care of me. <laughs> No, I, absolutely. So, you know, casting our minds all the way back to when we first met over the Spellman files, could you have written those books in a social media environment? You know, I've often wondered, because I, you know, I think about going back to them and I, and I worry about just how much social media I would have to, to use. I know that I acknowledged it to a certain extent in some of the books, because they're, they're PIs and PIs would use it a lot. Um, I could, I feel like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have been the same thing as the first book, which I, right. I think needed to be what it was. So I'm glad it was pre-social media, but it, you know, it could be done. Well, yeah, I mean, one thing you could do, of course, would just to move it back in time. But I was thinking that, you know, the Spellman, I mean, that worked because it wasn't social media and there was 
it was possible to have more privacy and keep more things under the radar and all the rest of it. And private, you know, private eyes have really had to change. Um, you know, yeah. they used to be actually out on the street and, you know, think about Archie Goodwin, you know, slapping shoe leather all over New York City while Nora Wolf was either watering the orchids or in the kitchen with Fritz. And, you know, today he'd be on a computer, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's so, so different. Um, but on the other hand, because um, there's a... what what. I'm trying to think, did I just read this or has it just come up? A whole, a whole mystery about, oh yeah, it's a new book by a woman named Peck, P-E-K. And um, they've been hired to verify, that's the verb, they're verifiers, um, for people who meet each other on dating apps. Oh, okay. And so basically what they what they're doing is in, you know, yeah. they're detectives, they're investigating, is this person that has this profile on dating, you know, the dating app. Is that really who this person is? Or is it, you know, you know, some child predator in Odessa or whatever it might be? Um, and so that's a whole new like career path, you know, for investigators. You could you could actually do something fun with that. No, I actually when you told me about that, I thought that's a good idea. So I I, you know, and I mean a, a terrifying concept for someone, you know, yeah, to actually. Uh, I can't even wrap my head around it, but, you know. Well, I'm only 10 pages in because uh, I keep falling asleep. <laughs> I used to be able to read into the midnight hour. And now by the time I've done with social media and all the rest of it, and then regrettably, um, in order to sort of unwind from a screen, I wind up watching a screen yeah. um, with, you know, with my household. Um, <laughs> and I have to say a boon, I think, Lisa, of all of this is there's just a ton of really great streaming television, but it certainly cuts into reading time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know. You used to work in, in television, didn't you? Don't I remember that you had some, at least. Yeah. I worked on um, HBO's The Deuce and then um, Megan Abbott, when she had her show, Dare Me, I was on the, the writing staff of that. So that was, you know, and that was not too long ago. Well, now it's more like two years, but yeah, I've done those shows. So do you have, you know, how's the writing room? How's working in a writing room different than writing a novel besides the obvious? I mean, it's night and day. It's a totally different thing. Um, and how's the writing room? There were two different rooms. So they were, you know, completely different experiences. I mean, it was, I, I learned a lot. Um, and, de you know, I, I don't want to say like with Megan's room, it was great because it was all women and uh, everyone was kind of really respectful and stuff. Uh, and it was, I know Megan really well. So I kind of knew if I felt like I could contribute more with the deuce. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying anything disparaging with the deuce. I felt like I was the person who came into the room who hadn't studied every day. And the fact is, I was the person in the room who hadn't studied because they'd send us all this material and I'd just be like, oh God, I'm not reading that. And everyone else would have. So it just felt, it felt a little bit like I, I had a lot of like testing, you know, you dreams, you still get dreams. Cause I still get dreams about like, I'm supposed to take a test. And then I realized, oh, oh, I haven't studied. And then, I wake up, I'm like, oh, great, I'm not in school anymore. It was like that, but I still have that. Or I have the dream where you're supposed to feed someone's dog and then you've forgotten, it was like days later. So I don't know why I told you that. See, and now I'm gonna be paranoid because I said it out then people are hearing and it seems like it's just us talking, but it's not. You have to keep in mind that yes, indeed, there is an audience, but at the same time, you know, um, I think, you have their credit card numbers? <laughs> I was thinking, you know, that people used to have um, dinner table conversations. You know, if you read historical fiction at all, or even nonfiction, you recognize that, um, you know, people used to have elaborate political dinners or, you know, in conversation, intelligent conversation about various topics and so forth was supposed to be 
um, you know, how it went. Um, if you were launched into society, you had to know about talking about things and so forth. So it's just a, it's a different context. There were people listening then. It was just a, a smaller group and you knew who they were. That's the difference is you yeah, actually totally knew different. who they were. Yeah. And you could allow for that then. You could say, oh, you know, I've got to be careful around so-and-so and whatever. But when you've got sort of yes. this unknown universe, um, that's, that's harder. So it's interesting that you chose to explore two characters who have, in fact, got so many secrets, even though ostensibly they are so close. Um, well, how, did, how did you write that? Did you write their backstories first? Or did you create them and then you just, and then you sort of went down, you know, a trail with each one of them to construct the backstory? No, I, I, I always sort of, I tend to write in the, like, write in the order that you read. And then I will, when I realize, oh, I need a little bit more here or there, I'll add it. And then often what will happen is I will know I'll have something big. Like if someone has a big secret, I may not, when I start the book, know what that secret is, but I'm giving myself time to figure out something that really makes sense for the story. That happened with The Passenger as well. Like it took me a long time to kind of work out the ending, even though I knew the basic sort of construct of it and how it would work into the crime novel. So uh, yeah, with uh, Luna, she has a secret from her, childhood and that was something that took me a while to figure out but when I did I felt like this was the right thing to do um and then it was the same thing with Owen like I, I knew something about how it would all sort of wrap up in the end uh but not exactly um and I I really hashed that stuff out a lot to make sure it feels right to me at least to me I mean I think my logic's really sound I know that sometimes people disagree with it, but they're wrong. And I, I mean, I, my logic's right on the, these things. So, yeah. I asked you the question about the writer's room because inevitably it's collaborative if you're writing, you know, scripts, if you're doing television or movie and so forth. And, you know, a novel, you're on your own um, and you get, to, you get to get to these truths on your own. Um, and you did, yet yeah, you wrote one book with another person, right? <laughs> yeah, Heads You Lose, which might actually be made into a film. Seriously, it might be the first thing of mine ever, ever made. Didn't you bring him to the store? I did, yeah, he came. Yes. He I, I, I'm, I'm sure I remember, and we had a conversation, if I recall, about how the two of you wrote a book together, because, you know, obviously that wasn't your normal, your normal thing. Right, but that was all, that book was all about whenever I would hear stories about like James Patterson or whoever writing books with other people, that just sounded crazy to me. And I wanted to write a comedic novel, sort of playing that up and figuring out how to make fun of that whole concept. Because I'm in, if I weren't making fun of the idea and playing with it, I would never have written a book with Dave. He's a great writer, but it would have been awful, awful if we were trying to write a serious book together. Like when you write a novel, the great thing about it is it's yours. Like right. you have, you like you get off on the power. Like, you know, no one can, it's, it's like totally your own thing. And then with the writer's room, it's actually kind of easy. At least it took me a little while to figure it all out, but it's kind of easy because you accept going in. If you're not the showrunner, it's not yours. So you're just contributing ideas but you can't, you don't really have ownership over it. You have to, you do your best with your script, but it's ultimately someone else's concept and they're, they have final say. And when you know that, that's fine too. They pay you well. Um, but the best thing about writing novels is that time you get to, to really kind of work things out and to explore things you're, you're interested in. It's like, cause I always feel like I have to write what I would read. And then that's, that's worked the best for me. It doesn't always work. It doesn't work for everyone. A lot of people don't understand what I'm doing. That's fine. But I can't be bored. 
writing it. So that, yeah, I think I might've lost track of, did I go off on a tangent? No, 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 oh, okay. no. I mean, we, you know, there's not a lot we can, we can really, can't go too far in discussing the accomplice because unfortunately we're going to end up spoiling it. So instead yeah. we do as we always do at Poison Pen, we digress into other topics. <laughs> and, um, and quite often, I mean, there are more collaborative novels coming out or people who are writing in other people's universes, you know, universes that were created by Tom Clancy or Clive Cussler or the other night we, Ace Atkins and I had a wonderful evening talking about Robert B. Parker. And in all of those cases, you know, the, the, the writers have had to work with other people's ideas, other people's communities, you know, other people's um, um, characterizations and so forth. And, and the question for especially somebody like Ace, you know, where, where Bob Parker created these things and now he's sadly been gone for 10 years. And so how, do you, can, you, how can you expand or change or update that universe that another author created and yet try to remain true to the values and the, you know, the whole feeling of, of that. And this is a question that really fascinates readers. So I'm just anticipating the questions that Patrick would come up with because people are so interested. Every event we do almost, people want to know about the writing process. You know, how is right. it? Uh, so I was just in, anticipating. Um, and that <laughs> is, since, since I knew that you had written in a, not books, well, one book collaboratively, but you know, you'd written scripts and you'd worked in writers' rooms, right? And yeah. that's different than writing your own novels. That's why I was going off into that. I mean, I I like there are many things about the collaborative process that I enjoy, but I don't think I could do it with a novel. Uh, uh, yeah. What did you learn from it? Did you learn anything that you then brought back to your own, you know, individual writing? And that could be things you learn not to do as well as things you learn to do. I mean, I think I, with the, with the TV stuff, it was more, it was more specific in that I learned things for T for script writing. So I think with, when you write anything, you, it probably does something for you, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't know whether, you know, it had, it might've, change the way you pace the book or, you know, maybe dialogue comes easier. Although you've always written wonderful dialogue. And of course you, you, you've, you know, there's, there's humor. There's always late, either overt or latent humor in what you write. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that a lot. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm trying to think, do I, what do I, I yeah. I, but I never know that I've ever learned anything. Like, you know, I if you asked me with this book, like I thought, I think maybe I'm going downhill. Maybe it keeps getting worse and worse. So I always think like my brain's deteriorating and I'm like, because I find the timelines really hard to keep track of. And, you know, I keep a lot of notes, but I it does my head in by the end of the book, this timeline business. And then every time I do a dual timeline or a multiple point of view thing, I, I say, never again, I'm going to write next book. I write, it's going to start on a Monday and it's going to end on a Friday. And there's no flashbacks, no nothing. But then I think, Oh, how do I tell a story that way? You know? So, you know, I'm not going to ask you where you get your ideas, but I, I think it would be interesting to know where, you know, how did this story germinate for you? I mean, something must have touched it off in your mind. I mean, I had, I had the idea for the frame of the story and how the sort of twist at the end. So I had this sort of, like for me, getting the sort of the nuts and bolts and the things that you need a crime novel to have, that's, that's the hardest part, like character and just backstory and, dealing with people that that's fun and then creating like, like I like the idea of chaos when I, when I'm brainstorming, like I, if something seems crazy to me, but also like real and 
natural, I get really excited about it. So I think that was, there were like a lot of moments in the book that where I was like, oh, and it felt really kind of exciting because it wasn't, it wasn't a traditional thing you see in a crime novel, but it was surprising. And that, that to me is like the big goal when I'm writing. Like, I just want people to wake up because whenever I'm reading something or I'm watching something, I love that moment where you're like, oh, wait, I don't know what I'm actually seeing here. And it's like kind of exciting. Right. So, you know, are you already, this book has now been completed for quite a while. Um, do you have something germinating in your mind at the moment, a different kind of story? Yeah, I have something germinating, but it's, it's a slow process because this whole like moving out of this house is taking me a really long time and it's uh, taken a lot of my mental energy. So once I uh, get across the country and find a place with a desk, I have to get started right away and do some work because it's been a long time. I thought I thought the germinating would I'd get more from from it. Like I thought I might just have a whole story, but I I do think that maybe the problem is I haven't actually just sat in front of a computer and started writing, and maybe maybe I do need to do that. So well, it's also possible that you know your subconscious is churning away, and when you do finally sit down, you know things. I mean, I've always thought that writing was a lot more about thinking than it was about actually putting the words down. I, I hope my subconscious has been busy. <laughs> I don't um, know. I love the idea that my subconscious could be like, you know, typing away while I'm useless. Well, you know, you don't shy away from rebooting your life. And, you know, I would think that that, you know, may release a lot of mental energy. You know, it's so easy to get into a rut and just do the same old thing, but you know, you've been, you've been pretty ruthless about um, changing <laughs> your life and that alone should be, you know, a source of, well, maybe despair sometimes, but anyway, hopefully a source of energy as well. No, I, you're actually right. Cause I, you know, this living out here has been tricky, but I got a lot from it uh, writing wise. So hopefully the same thing happens. Patrick, why don't you come join us? Because we're basically talking about the whole writing process, and that's a subject that really interests you. So you've you've read Lisa's books along with me. Yeah. You've known her for a long time. Absolutely, yeah. And a lot of what a lot of what you guys have said, I found really really interesting. Um, you know, a, a little bit earlier, Lisa, you were talking about you know when you were talking about social media and everything, the word clutter came up. You know, and I'm thinking. And you also said a couple of things that really resonated with me, like my, I'm, you know, to paraphrase you, I'm feeling like my brain is atrophying or, you know, <laughs> I have that, I have that feeling too. And it's um, all this, like the soundbite culture that we're surrounded in and the social media, and there's just so much mental clutter and static everywhere. Um, it seems like it's the, it's the enemy of reflection. You know, it's the enemy of, um, you know, having that time to really focus on, on, on thinking, you know, and let alone writing. How do you, are, are you pretty strict about, you know, you mentioned your privacy um, of having that solitude that you need to get the work done? Well, okay. So here's the problem with me in recent in the last few years. So once I finished this book, it was, there was a lot of, you know, the moving things, trying to sell the house, all that stuff happened. So I would say that I got really good at staying away from social media, but it's not like I used that time to get a lot of work done, but I got so good at staying away from social media and the news that I realized that like every once in a while I'd like check back in and all these things would have happened. And I knew nothing about them. Like I had no idea what was going on. I didn't even know that there would be like a huge snowstorm coming in, like stuff like that. So I might've taken it too far, like just block out everything, but it was sort of nice too. Like, I didn't feel like, I think when you're on social media and you live in an isolated place, I mean, I don't feel lonely on the level that I think a lot of people do, especially people who live the way I do. So I don't experience it in a normal way, but 
I think I would feel lonely if I were on social media a lot, trying to engage, although it just right. seems foreign. But like being totally cut off from things was very like kind of nice. Like I don't know, it made me feel safe. I yeah. Right. Well, I don't distraction. Know. I think distraction is very hard to deal with. It's it's really hard to find, you know, enough time to read. I wasn't, you know, kidding when I said I, I fall asleep because, you know, by the time I get to a place where everything's quiet, I don't have to respond to anybody or whatever it is, I'm so tired. And instead of reading, you know, I wind up falling asleep. You know, I'm sort of the caricature, you know, falling asleep over my book clunk, you know, his me. <laughs> and um, and I'm, I'm finding it really hard to carve out reading time. Patrick, you must, you know, both of us are experiencing right. that. Yeah, I, I hate it, you know, I mean, because yeah. I, I really, I really, you know, think about those times when, you know, three or four hours, you know, where you just kind of be at night, usually for me. And now it's like, oh, yeah, what's going on with this thing? You know, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not immune to the, to it either. You know, it's very addictive to, yeah, you know, to, to get distracted. It's very easy to get distracted. No, I mean, I don't, I don't hope I'm not painting a picture of myself as someone who's like, no, not at all. Sitting, up, reading a book quietly and not like doing totally stupid, like, <laughs> you know, what, streaming some crap while I do crossword puzzles, which is really like yep. my weird addiction now. And I'm so bad at crossword puzzles. It's like, I, it's love, crossword actually puzzles. Do. I love crossword puzzles too. I um, love them, but I'm bad at them. It's just like chess. I'm so bad at chess. I only play computer chess because it can't judge me. <laughs> have I've you seen that to wordle I, I i have to say and yeah. my husband really wounded me when he said i'm not i know i'm not logical enough he said i won't be good at wordle because i'm not you know, so so far i've only i mean i can nail almost all of them in three occasionally i've had two Ooh. and once in a while four only once have i actually gone to five and it was just a toss-up because i could have used you know i had a choice between mints and wince and I went with the M, but I, you know, turned out to be the W or the other way around. So that was just, you know, whatever. And, and I find, you know, even that is a distraction, but yet it keeps me from doing something even stupider, <laughs> if, no, if that makes I, any I, sense. Yeah. I mean, I like Wordle, although my thing is like, I really just want to get it in one. <laughs> like well, that's you, that, that's virtually impossible i i, I don't think, care i want to feel like oh i hear you i think three is reasonable two two is i mean one would be blind luck two would be you know i've done it in two but i think three if you're good is about normal i think one means i'm psychic and I, yeah, I, right or just lucky you know pantry do you even know what we're talking about <laughs> I've heard, I've heard of it, but I, I don't know more than that. It's a, it's a word game, basically. It's a it's a grid with five letters, and you you type in a word that meets five letters, and it tells you whether any of those letters are in the in the keyword. And okay. it, you as you do it, you keep refining it, you know, down to um, so that you can eventually work. You get you only get five tries to see if you can figure out the word of the day. I did find it interesting though, that I did one today that I thought was really a good word. And it said to me, it's not on the approved word list. That was the first time I'd encountered that. And I thought, why not? You know, I mean, it's a real word. Why is it on the list? So there's a rabbit hole that you can go on, but it's better than doom scrolling, I think, um, which yeah. we were all addicted to during, you know, during 2020, I think. Sadly, yeah. many of us wasted copious energy doom scrolling through social media. We just couldn't believe what was going on. Totally. Are you a, are you a true crime fan at all, Lisa? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Now yeah. we're talking. Yeah. But I, it's more. I feel like I read. Well, I mean, I I can't remember the last true crime I read, which is sad. But I watch a lot. I love. I love. Yeah, I love watching it. And you know, at the beginning of the conversation, you were talking about. Um, um, just you know, what am I trying to say? There are parts of us, all of us, that are completely unknowable from even the people that are closest to us. You know, yeah. I mean, there's 
I, you know, I know my wife on a certain level, but there's parts of her that I don't know, you know? Yeah. Um, um, we all have our little secrets, don't we? Well, we all keep mutating too. I mean, I think, you know, yeah. it's a combination of, you know, things in our past that, that we might not even be honest with ourselves about, because one way you survive your life is to tell stories about to yourself yeah. about what happened. And many of them are self exculpatory, you know, because you're not really happy with whatever um, that was. And then, you know, part of it is that as a result, we're mutating on and maybe other people don't keep up or miss the cues. You know, I mean, I'm always amazed when I see people who have been married for like 40 years and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're in their 60s and they decide to split up. And I think, why? You know, why would you do that? But maybe that's the explanation is that they mutated into places where they could no longer sustain a relationship, which is sort of what you're dealing with here in the accomplice or, right. or might be dealing with. Maybe. I mean, maybe. We, don't know. we don't know how it ends. I mean, I know. I wrote it, but. Right. And I know because I read it, but we okay. aren't telling you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how about a few words about the swallows? Because, you know, that really liked that book and it was, I like the, you know, the whole setup of, of, again, a person at a crossroads, you know, sort of starting over that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? What inspired that particular book? So, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, like a tricky book for me to figure out the right language for. It's like always, because like, I think the way I would, uh, okay. So The Swallows is about a, a teacher who starts at a, a New England like boarding school, sort of a low end uh, prep school. And she realizes that there's something very sinister going on within the student body uh, in terms of the relationships between the girls and the boys and that the boys are sort of ranking the girls on certain things. And uh, the teacher decides to do something about it along with the student. And it's sort of about what happens when everybody starts to wake up to what's going on around them. And yeah, to be perfectly honest, I wrote it long enough ago that I'm like, hey, what was it about? Like the exact <laughs> details. <laughs> no, I really love that book. That was Thank you. Yeah, that, I, I love that book too. And it's, it's the book of mine that people are the most sort of one way or the other, like, man, I'd never had such hate on a book than I did on that one. Interesting. I mean, I don't mind that sort of thing, but uh, at all, <laughs> but it was fascinating how angry it made some people. Really? Oh yeah. Touched angry the nerve, huh? It just, they either thought it was super gross and were just totally put off by it or didn't think it was plausible, which made me, that made me a little angry because it's not great when, when people don't think something is real when it's real. And, you know, that, that could be, that's a little frustrating, but yeah. And that, that was interesting, just structurally uh, writing from, I think it was uh, four different characters and doing the different voices, but also like timeline wise, sort of overlapping somewhat. I think if I had a better brain, I would, do that stuff more. Yeah. Well, let me let me see if we can ask a couple of these questions that people have been turning in. Uh, Helena has actually some really interesting questions. Did you ever read Harriet the Spy? Is one of her questions. Yeah, I actually read it as a a grown up. Um, I can't remember a friend in college. Somehow it came up, and she told me to read it. And I had just never, as a kid, I don't know how I missed it. I loved it. Yeah. I, yeah, it's a great book. How about The Wind in the Willows? Yes, it used to be my sleep book. Uh, there's a, some really good audio of it. So, uh, yeah, it's a great kind of British whimsy. Randy and Mole. Yep. Um, yeah. Although yeah. I heard some crazy stories about um, the author. Graham? Uh, Kenneth yeah. Graham? Yeah. His... Um, Apparently he was, there were, I'm a little bit wrong. There was an assassination attempt made against him. And then his son later went, started calling himself by the name of the guy who tried to assassinate his father. Really? Uh, yeah. I 
think that's it. There's this like show uh, called QI. It's like this British, uh, it's like comedians. Uh, it's sort of a game show, but it's just comedians learning facts and taking, it's a little, it's really great. It's very, very funny. But then they have these books with all these sort of little factoids, but it's what's very- it What's it called QI? again? It's, yeah, it's on like BritBox. It's really great. Uh. Sandy Postfig does is the MC now and it used to be Stephen Fry. It's been on for years. It's like the funniest wow. show. But I, I you heard know that Barbara. What? Do you I know don't, Barbara? I don't know it, but I was thinking, you know, there there are a number of children's books authors that, you know, are deeply suspect, the authors themselves. Um, and and maybe, you know, maybe to write those kinds of whimsical or fantastical or whatever it is, you have to be somewhat odd um, to begin with, um, you know. That was just the tip of the iceberg. There's also some weird thing about how he would write letters, like baby talk letters, like really excruciatingly awful letters to his mistress or something. I need to find this part of the book and then I'll, I'll share it with you. Is that right? I'm in the villa, so it's really a lot of fun to read. So, you know, divorce yourself from any <laughs> thoughts about the author and just, just enjoy um, enjoy the fantasy. I mean, look at Lewis Carroll. You could do a whole psychoanalysis of Lewis Carroll, or you could just like Alice in Wonderland, you know? Yeah. yeah. Don't have to do both. I wasn't looking for it, but then now that I know. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, wait a minute. Let me go over to Facebook. Equal opportunity questions here. Uh, Tony, um, Tony from Romania. He says, uh, I love your Spellman series so much and have read every book. Um, who, were your, who were your literary impl influences? I, I feel like this is not a question I'm good at because basically, I mean, I, I wrote the first book because no one would, I couldn't get anywhere with my screenplays, and but I never ever thought I could be a writer. So all of the writers I emulated, I mean, I I, I admired. I never would have thought to emulate anyone, or so I'm. I I don't really have influences on how I write. I just like accept that I have my own limitations that I have to work around, and so it's. I, I yeah. Other people that inspire you though among your among your peers They're just not necessarily like people right. that i yeah it's it's there it's too off like there aren't um i mean there might be some i don't know yeah it's not a good question in terms of like i don't let anyone in my head for mm -hmm. they're right you know obviously there are tons of writers i like yeah let's see here what else we got uh and uh asks are you happier writing standalones no, I mean, I, I'm very happy with the, the result. I think they've been really good, but I was just a happier person writing those Spellman books. It was a, an easier life. I did them faster and, you know, like I, I definitely specifically noticed the difference um, when I was working on the Swallows. And granted, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that was rough. And there were other things that were intense, but that was like, I, I don't remember being in such a great mood. But with the Spellman books, I mean, granted, I wrote most of the Spellman books during the Obama era. So some of it's about that, but it was just fun. It was like, I was trying always every day looking for the joke. And so, no, I haven't, but I, I think I've done a good job with the, the standalones. Would you go back to a series if you had an idea for a different group? You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be the Spellmans necessarily. I, you know, the, no, I, I probably wouldn't do a series because the Spellmans were so specific and it, I don't know that I could come up with something that would be equally funny. And like, like that was a certain very, I, I just don't think I can do that again. And I would, uh, it's hard to imagine something I'd want to stay with because, you know, it's like when you have a family, you have, there's just infinite possibilities. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the next one I, I want to write is about a family, but 
uh, it, I definitely don't see it having more than, more than one. Well, someone named uh, Jackie Spellman is tuning in, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the lost family members. This, this, I know, it's so funny. It happens a lot. Uh, let's see. Okay, Helena has another good question. How do you incorporate pets into narratives? Do you have certain pets in your life that are in your books? I mean, I, I've definitely had pets. Wait, maybe not that many. I don't even know. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a whole, there's like a whole pet ferret business in a, it's actually called the business of, of ferrets uh, in a, the accomplice. I mean, I have a complicated relationship with pets because my mom like used to show dogs and our house was sort of like, we lived in the top floor of a duplex and then we would be overrun with dogs. I would just go to school with dog hair all over me. They used to call them, my parents used to call the dogs, my brothers and sisters. They were super, it was super weird, super over the top. So, and I've never had a pet as, as an adult because it's like, I think it was just so, it was too much. But I still like, when I'm around dogs, I, I do feel very comfortable with them. And I like them a lot. Um, so That's a great setup for a novel. <laughs> that, that, that background. I would read that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was very strange. Wow. As someone who has six cats and a dog, I have no comment. <laughs> really? Six yeah, cats? Yeah, it's an infestation, definitely. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But the dog, that sort of like, because uh, I have a lot of I have a lot of friends who are I would are cat people, like 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 surprising level of cat people. Um, my cousins, they um, they have a they have the kind of cat that likes to go for walks, like actually on a leash, and they do that. I mean, there are some cats that actually are really into that kind of thing. But when you have a dog and all those cats, you I can't judge you as being a cat person. <laughs> Yeah, it's, sure. it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Uh, they have a, you know, the cats okay. jump up on higher ground and taunt the dog. The cats are generally smarter than the dog. Yeah. So they have this fun give and take. But then when it gets chilly out like it is now, they'll, they'll all cuddle up together <gasps> and stuff. Really? Yeah. yeah it's I fun. can hear the puppies knocking at the door. So we yeah. do you post pictures of that? I'd like to see pictures of that. Um, there are pictures on Instagram of the puppies um, because we got them when they were just a couple of months old and only four pounds. And now How many dogs do you have, Barbara? Three. We have an older dog um, and her older dog died. We had to put him down last a year ago in January because he developed, I think, liver cancer or whatever it was anyway. And then um, we adopted, we were intending to adopt one and the breeder brought the remaining litter mate who ah. was going to be left all alone. And so <laughs> there we were, right? Are we really going to do this? Or, you know, so we thought, well, we'll take them both, which I think turned out to be a really good idea. And once we've gotten past potty training, it's not so exhausting um, right. as it was. And we're there. Um, so we actually have a dog trainer who's coming in once a week to work with us on civilizing them. And I don't, I figure she's got maybe a 50% shot because neither Rob nor I is really what I would describe as a true disciplinarian. <laughs> yeah, they're so cute. We wind up just cracked up watching them instead of actually, um, you know, getting them. The, you know, uh, an author that we were very close to here um, and his wife adopted or had a number of dogs and they had, I'm telling you, a really serious dog trainer, an Israeli dog trainer. I think he wow. possibly worked for, you know, um, Israeli intelligence or something. And, you know, and we thought about it, but to train a dog to that level took all the personality out of the dog. And, you know, I, I didn't see that that was going to improve our lives. And I could see that he absolutely hated one of our dogs because she's just such a rebel. And I thought, you know, I don't want him to break her spirit. 
And every once in a while, when she tries to eat her way through the glass, when the UPS guy rings the doorbell, I think maybe I made the wrong call. <laughs> but, you know, I'd rather she were that way. So it all depends on your own personality. You know what it is you expect out of your pets. Yeah, no, definitely. Right, yeah. Patrick? I mean, there are a couple more questions. I'm sorry to neglect these folks. Okay, um, bring them in. Carry it away. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Barbara wants to know. By the way, Barbara has a great name, Barbara Jingles. I think that's an awesome name. Very Dickensian. Okay. Uh, she says, "Did you relate more with David, Isabel, or Ray?" Oh, um, I I related more to Isabel, but the boss at the PI firm where I worked, uh, he would come to my readings and stuff after the book came out. Um, and he, like, I worked with him for a while, so he knew me pretty well. He would just say at the readings, she's Ray. She's so Ray. I mean, I don't know if, I'm not sure if that, how accurate that was. And it could also partly have to do with the fact that I think he didn't want to imagine me getting, like, drunk all the time. But, uh, I mean, I definitely have some level of Ray in me, but I relate it to Isabel. Uh, let's see. Andrea would like to know, she says... Would you like to see any of your books made into a television series or a movie? No, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. yeah, of course. That's always like what you hope for. I mean, I, uh, I, there's, there's a chance with the swallows, but I don't, I don't know where, where it's at, but there's a script that I really love. Um, mm -hmm. so we'll see. Um, I hope so. Um, oh, and heads you lose might actually be made. Like, I, I, I mean, I feel like uh, they're getting pretty close, but it's not going to be like the book, although it will be like the book. It's I won't get into it now, but yeah. Well, the way, you know, the way streaming services and TV are evolving, there's many more books going to have a shot um, yeah. at being made into into television than yeah. ever there were chances for them to become movies. Um, I think, you know, there's such a big, big television. Um, it's hard to feed it. There's just so much, you know, yeah. content that's required. Um, and I, I mean, it's a real golden age for um, books into, into um, visual platforms. Yeah. Um, and it, occasionally it works that, you know, it used to be that people made books from movies, but I'm not seeing so much of that. I'm seeing it's, in television, it, I'm not seeing people serializing the TV show necessarily. I mean, we've had Star Trek and Star Wars and stuff like that, but it seems to me it's more more book to movie or book to TV than it is TV to book at the moment. Is that right? Do you think I'm wrong there, Patrick? I don't know. A, I, I think you might be right about that. Yeah. Did you I see mean, Mayor of East Town, Lisa? Oh yeah, it was great. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, there's a cryptic question from somebody that you may know. Okay. And it is, what about Irving? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I'm now I'm like, is this so? Ir Irving was uh, the cat in Heads You Lose, which even I had to like think about, and uh, I think that I might have, I might have off the cat in in the book, uh, not me. So if that's Dave, I don't know. I just, it seems like Dave would have better things to do. Not, no offense, but it's hard for me to imagine him <laughs> watching this. But if that's Dave, enough already. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I think that's about it. Uh, a lot of people right. just saying how much they like your work and, you know, nice things like that. Well, that's good. Is there anything really mean? Come on, tell me. No, no. we're not going to do that. No, um, I mean, there's a reason why we monitor the comments. You know, I mean, only a fool would actually just put a grip, in my opinion. So no, there's nothing like that. No, okay, not at all. I mean, people do love your work, Lisa. I certainly do. Patrick does. I'm, you know, I, I'm glad you're always yourself. I, I really am. You know, you haven't tried to. Um, fit yourself, you know, into any particular um, mold. And, you know, so it's always a joy to, to read your books because you never, I never know what, what I'm going to get. 
<laughs> That's good. Which I I'm think is the good thing. You know, I mean, it's wonderful to be surprised. Um, so I really like that. I will look forward to whatever comes out once you've managed to relocate yourself and you, you know, and me both. <laughs> yeah, and get in front of a computer. So we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Yes. Um, let, I'd like to thank everybody who spent some time with us in this totally digression ridden conversation, but most of it is because this is not a book that you can really discuss in any detail without spoiling the reading experience for anybody. So that's in part why we've done it. Uh, Lisa has, as Patrick has mentioned, thoughtfully autographed copies for us and sent them to us. So please take advantage of that, buy a copy and, um, Go off and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Lisa. Stay in touch from the road so we'll know you're okay, will you? Yeah, I will. And thank you both so much. It was really nice to see you this way. Okay. It was, it was I'll a send great you some pleasure. Cat, cat and dog videos if you like. I would, I, would, I like those a lot. So yeah. yes, do. <laughs> we can Sarah Grand's a big sure. fan of them too. Yep. All right. <laughs> so I, hear, I hear a puppy claw 